All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, I have uh, a really interesting uh, research that we're going to talk through today. Um, and before I introduce this, this team, I kind of just want to do a couple of housekeeping items um, to talk about some of the future uh, webinars we have coming up in this series. And so in two weeks, we're going to have Aaron Yellowitz from the University of Kentucky uh, Department of Economics, and he's presenting on uh, healthcare accessibility. And then the following two weeks on the March 30th, we're having Ben Laurie, who's the Associate Professor of Accounting at UC Irvine. Um, and he's gonna be presenting on actually research using the Revelio Labs data. So a different data set on the, on the Dewey platform uh, and talking about the workforce intelligence data um, and how, you know, the, in some of the work that they've done there. So um, thank you guys for subscribing to this series. Uh, we have a bunch of interesting uh, presentations coming up. Uh, but let's dive into the topic of choice today. So um, I want to introduce uh, Andre and Etienne. Um, so they have been doing some really interesting research uh, using SafeGraphs data for a while now. And so this is um, data that they were looking at kind of during COVID and uh, the effect of school closures on in-person learning, learning. I'll let them kind of introduce the topic in obviously a lot more detail. Uh, but with that, I'll just turn it over to this team. So thank you guys for coming today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Evan. I, I just realized that maybe I should go into screen share mode, um, which I'm not right now. So let me let me just do this. Sorry about that. Um, All right, take your time. Um, second. How is this? There we go. That looks better. All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. And so this is uh, joint work with uh, Etienne Lale, who's also here on uh, on the Zoom call. All right. So um, yeah, um, uh, let's get us started here. Um, I guess for most of us, uh, yeah, COVID is is a bit like a bad dream. Uh, but uh, in terms, of, uh, but in terms of um, research, it's it's still occupying a lot of us. Uh, and in in particular, one question that has been looked at a lot and will continue get, to get a lot of attention, we think, is how uh, school closures during COVID uh, impacted and will impact uh, uh, children's uh, achievement academically, their emotional well-being, as well as future earnings down the road. And so. Uh, for us, uh, for Etienne and me, who have worked a lot on with SafeGraph data during the pandemic and other uh, type of data sets, uh, this raises a natural measurement question, I would say, which is simply how much did in-person learning actually decline? And then where did it decl decline most and for whom? And we do have uh, a lot of information on this, but uh, we felt that there's just not uh, much consistent and high quality and granular data around. And so... Uh, what we uh, uh, embarked on is uh, we, we uh, combined SafeGraph data on school visits uh, with information from various uh, schooling mode trackers that I will talk about more in detail to estimate what we call a effective in-person learning measure or EIPL. And we're doing this at the school level for uh, different school types. Uh, so we can identify whether a school is public, a charter school, a religious school, or a private school for different grade levels. Um, it's covering uh, both 2020-21 school year as well as 21-22 school year, which is probably the more important one here because they're, that's where the biggest discrepancies across uh, schools in terms of EIPL happen. And the data set um, that we have at the end of the day is a, a, is a data set of uh, more than 70,000 schools uh, at a weekly frequency. And uh, we are making this publicly available at the at the link that I'm posting here. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna talk about in the next half hour is, I first wanna start with um, documenting a bit the problems with existing schooling mode trackers, which then provides the, uh, the motivation for what we are doing. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about the safe graph data and how we um, identify visits to schools, uh, how we are estimating our EIPL measure, and then I'm going to show you, if I have time, some results that uh, I hope uh, will be intriguing. All right. So starting with the schooling mode tracker. So there's a bunch of uh, uh, organizations or research teams 
that have come up with schooling mode trackers. And the way they uh, typically look uh, like is they say, well, um, in a particular school district or county, or maybe even a, at the state level, uh, there is X percent of students who are in a particular time period in traditional or in-person school, uh, another percent that is in hybrid school, and then another percent that is in virtual school. So that's typically the information that they made public, and, and uh, a, a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of attention uh, with, with this data. The issue is that when we look at different at these different trackers, either on average or across regions and time, we notice large discrepancies. And these discrepancies primarily come from the fact that these trackers use different definitions of what constitutes hybrid school. Is it two to three days for all the students? Is it more than that for all the students? Or uh, what is it exactly? And just to give you an idea of what I mean by discrepancies, we're showing you here for eight different trackers uh, from uh, uh, for, for the 21 22 school year, um, uh, sorry, 2021 school year, we're showing you here the percent that they on average uh, um, reported as uh, uh, percent of students that uh, they are reported as being in hybrid learning mode, whatever that means. And you can see large differences. What that means then also in turn is that the percent in either in person or traditional learning mode or virtual learning mode is also very different. Um, and in fact, just reverted from what we see here. Um, uh, so uh, just to give you an idea, right, the two of the trackers that we will use later on, Burbio and R2L for return to learn. These are sort of uh, some of the most um, uh, common trackers, right? For Burbio, virtual is, is below consistently by a lot than R2L, which is the red line. And then vice versa, traditional there, Burbio is above, and so it is for virtual, but for R2L, it's below. And so this is a big issue because when you want to do quantitative analysis, you actually need to know the number. What is it? How much in-person learning did these students get? And based on just these trackers, well, then you have to make a choice. Which one do you trust more? And that's not clear at all. And the results that you get uh, uh, can actually be quite different depending on which tracker you use. And so, so this is just a basic problem, we think. Um, that has not been addressed in, in the literature. Uh, the other uh, issue also is that the qualitative nature of the tra these trackers limits just more generally, even when you don't want to choose between different trackers to quantitative analysis, right? So when you think about hybrid learning, how much in-person learning does, does that really mean? Is it 40%? Is it 60%? Is it 80%? And then vice versa, is traditional really 100% or could it be 20%? How about virtual? Is it in 0%? Could it be 20%? So these are really big issues that, um, that, uh, that just limit what you can do with these trackers. And then from a more technical aspect also, there's, there's some recent work, uh, econometrics uh, work that shows that if you have mutually exclusive treatments, which in this case here would be, right? A mutually exclusive treatment is a, a, a student or a school is in either traditional hybrid or virtual. They cannot be in two or three of them together. When you have these mutual exclusive treatments, then when you do causal inference, then uh, what you uh, uh, easily can get is, is, is bias in your, um, in, in your estimates. And, and that's, a, that's a big issue. Um, and then finally, these trackers also have relatively limited coverage, um, at least some of them, and the granularity uh, is, is somewhat limited. They certainly don't go to the school level. So with that being said, what we do here is we want to harness the power of SafeGraph uh, by coming up with a better measure um, that then also relates to, to these different uh, uh, trackers. So SafeGraph, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, provides uh, information on millions of what they call points of interest or POIs in the U.S., including on industry codes of each of these POIs, if they have any, say a business, and, and uh, weekly visits for many of them that are derived from anonymized cell phone data that is, is, is then geolocated to these point of interest. Um, what we do here is we retain all the PAO, uh, POIs that have a particular NAICS code that is associated with elementary and secondary schools. That's about 125,000 POIs. 
which covers most of the schools um, uh, from elementary to high school level that we have in the United States. What we then do is we uh, merge uh, this, uh, these POIs to uh, school level data from the National Center of Education Statistics um, to get a lot of uh, characteristics uh, for these schools. So for instance, the share of uh, uh, non-white students, uh, how many receive uh, free lunch and so forth and so forth. Um, the data uh, from the NCES comes in two forms. One is for public schools. There is the universe of all public schools. That's about 100,000 schools. And then for private schools, there is a representative sample of about 30,000 schools uh, and we, we, uh, we merge uh, our safe graph data to both of these data sets. Results in about 110,000 high quality matches that are highly representative of the population, okay? So next, what we wanna do and what other people have done too using safe graph visits data for schools, and I'll come back to that, is we wanna uh, construct a percent change of visits relative to the baseline. So think of school J, right? We have uh, weekly visits. Uh, we wanna see how much lower in percent is it relative to say the pre-pandemic period, January, February of 2020, okay? Now, as we started doing this, we uh, came across a number of challenges in the raw safe graph data. Um, so first, the raw visit counts that you see in, the, in, in SafeGraph, they tend to trend upwards over time, even uh, so that, that would be before the pandemic. And, and so that's a bit of an issue if you want to do percentage changes during the pandemic. Um, it could simply be, right, that there's an upward trend because there are more cell phone devices being captured. And this is, this is what's, uh, what, what would then bias how much uh, a visit change is actually uh, indicative of school closure. And so what we do is we normalize by state level counts of SafeGraph cell phone devices that are being captured, which SafeGraph also offers. And, and, and uh, this takes care of this, these upward trends, okay? And then second, we see that there are large variation in short versus long visits within schools. And um, so SafeGraph, I should say, right? They provide visit, uh, visit counts by dwell time intervals. And so what we do is we, we construct a dwell time weighted measure of school visits to, um, to capture better what is actually the variation in visits associated with the people who are attending that school or going to that school. So more indicative of, of, of school opening, right? And then the third point is we also see, and I think this is um, this, this common knowledge for people who have delved into the nitty gritties of safe graph, there's a substantial fraction of POIs and therefore also schools where there's just not very good um, visit data because of uh, problems with geolocation. Um, and so we have a bunch of schools that have very sparse or very noisy visits data. And what we do is we drop, uh, we drop these schools based on some rules and uh, that results in a, re a reduction of the sample of about 37,000 schools. And um, so we have about 75,000 schools left and we reweigh those to, to keep the sample representative, okay? And I'm happy to talk more about this if anyone has questions. All right, now, next, um, there's a natural question here. Why shouldn't we just stop here and use the SafeGraph school visits data directly, right? You just say, you know, if the SafeGraph visits uh, for a particular school decline by 50%, well, doesn't that mean that the school is now uh, open to in-person learning by only 50%, right? That would be sort of the natural uh, uh, intuition here. The issue is, is that school visits may not change, or I should say visits to that POI that, um, that, that represents the school may not change one-to-one -one with EIPL. So a school could, for instance, have a playground and that playground may be open during the pandemic. And so, you know, if, if school visits don't drop all the way to 100%, then we shouldn't necessarily want to interpret this as the school being completely uh, uh, closed. Uh, it could be that uh, the school is closed uh, even before we get to 100% of, of school visits drops. Okay, so in that way, SafeGraph doesn't provide a direct metric of in-person learning. Okay, and I will show you some evidence that, that suggests that this is indeed the case. So what we do then instead 
is uh, we uh, derive a theoretical measure of EIPL, EIPL, meaning what it should be based on the information that we get from a particular tracker or each one of these trackers. And then we do an econometric technique to map uh, regression and, uh, technique to map it to school visits data. So this has several advantages. Uh, it does not impose the one-to-one -one relation between school visits changes and EIPL changes that I just explained. Uh, it allows for regional differences in the relation between school visits and tracker information. And then for each region, we will select the tracker, right? Because we have several of them that best is best explained by the visit data, meaning in an econometric uh, uh, way of, of thinking about it, where the measurement error is, is smallest. Okay. All right. So what is the true measure of EIPL uh, as, as it relates to the, uh, uh, the information that we get from a particular tracker? So these trackers, what they do is they provide information at either the county or the school district level. And so think of here as EIPL at some county level C in week T. Now we can derive that this is equal to the percent of schools or students that are in traditional mode. So in, in full in-person mode, plus some fraction gamma, um, or I should say some, some percent of students that are in hybrid mode where gamma then uh, here, that coefficient denotes the percent of total time that hybrid represents of in, 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 in terms of inter, uh, person schooling. And then the remaining terms here, these are measurement errors that are due to the fact that the tracker may not perfectly measure um, how much in-person schooling really happens when there is either traditional, hybrid, or virtual. Okay, so you could think of this as some average uh, errors that come uh, from this, and then some week by week mean zero error terms, these ADAs here. Okay. Now, moving on, right? Since both EIPL, that true unobserved measure of in person learning, and the change in visits from SafeGraph are in percent of a pre pandemic baseline, we can relate the two in this following equation, right? In particular, so pre-pandemic, when EIPL for a particular uh, county or district was 100% by definition of everyone being in person, then at the same time, the visits should be equal to the baseline. So delta V is zero, right? So we should be at 100, okay? And so, um, so this relationship here, right, allows for EIPL and visits to change in a not one-to-one -one way. So this beta here, we leave it open, doesn't have to be one, can be something else, okay? And then obviously there's an error term here that uh, would come from the fact that uh, SafeGraph also has a measurement error. Now, re uh, combining the two and rearranging what we get then is that a tracker's percent of in-person or traditional learning that happens in a, in a county or district is related then to some constant, which combines here the 100 from above plus that uh, uh, average error from the tracker um, plus right, beta times the change in visits minus the part that comes from uh, hybrid learning and these measurement error terms, okay? And so we're going to estimate this equation. We can estimate this simply by a linear regression and then for when we have the coefficient for beta, what we then do is that for each school within that county or district, we can compute an estimate of EIPL, which is equal to 100 plus that beta coefficient um, that applies to that uh, school's county or district times the change in visits. Okay, so this is our estimation approach. Um, we implement it. Uh, for, for reasons of statistical power, not at the county or school district level, although we could do so, but instead at the CBSA or state level. A CBSA is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a combination of counties that are adjacent to each other um, and that creates sort of a commuting zone, okay? And we do that estimation separately for data from two of these eight trackers. We choose the trackers that are called Burbio and Return to Learn simply because they have by far the largest coverage both in time and, and counties or districts covered, okay? And then for each of these CBSAs, we choose the regression estimate with the highest explanatory power, meaning where the measurement error either coming from SafeGraph or from the tracker is, is lowest, okay? And so what I'm showing you here 
are regression coefficient estimates across CBSAs, okay? So the mean beta here, if you note, is, is slightly higher than one. And that would confirm what I argued before that, you know, visits, they could drop less than 100% for EIPL to go to zero, meaning for a school to be completely closed on average, simply because many schools they will still record visits even if the, if the school is completely closed to in-person learning, okay? So, so that confirms this issue and, and provides empirical support for, for our EIPL measure over, say, simply using the safe graph visits data, okay? The other interesting uh, thing to note here is that on average, right, uh, the fraction of uh, in-person learning that is estimated to come from hybrid mode or uh, is is about one, uh, is about 30 percent so if there are about five days right think of it as on average this would be between one and two days okay and then the explanatory power of this regression is quite high on average about 0 0.8 now when you go across cpas you can also see that you see a lot of variation in these estimates which just says, goes to show again, right, that there may be quite um, different or hybrid may mean quite different things. And also the proportionality between EIPL and uh, visits may be quite different. And yeah, I want to, I, I just saw Evan posting here in the chat. Yeah, if you have any questions, please, uh, uh, please jump in. I'm happy, happy to answer them. Okay. All right. So, so this is our estimation approach. Now, uh, for the last uh, few minutes of my uh, presentation, let me show you a bit what we do uh, with, with this data, which, right, we have now 70,000 plus um, schools for which we have an estimate of EIPL um, and uh, at a weekly basis. And so, so uh, what we do here is do some basic analysis um, because, of course, we, since we we have mapped to uh, the data from the, the NCS, where we have a lot of school characteristics. And on top of that, we have a lot of other data at the very detailed geo level, say at the zip code, characteristics of, of the surroundings of a school. We can do a lot of different analysis here. Okay, So uh, the first result I want to show you here is that there are large disparities in EIPL by school type and region. Now, the school type part may be new, the region maybe not so much because it's been pre presented in, in quite some detail uh, uh, and it comes out of different trackers too, just from a qualitative point of view. All right, so let me show you first, all right, by school type. So we have four different school types, uh, public non-charter school, public charter schools, private religious schools, and private non-religious schools. And what you can see is that in March to May of 2020, there was not much difference. Every one of these, uh, uh, school types essentially had very low uh, uh, in-person learning. Um, most schools shut down uh, in March, and then some of them opened already, uh, you know, in May uh, at the end of the school year. And so you see a little bit of that here reflected in EIPL. But then you go to the 2021 school year, right? In fall of 20, you see a large difference in particular between um, public schools and um, private schools. What's interesting is that public charter schools were actually closed on average more or had less EIPL than public non-charter schools, what was somewhat of a surprise to us. And private religious schools were um, open more or had somewhat more EIPL than the private non-religious schools. And that's interesting because the price difference on average in tuition and therefore also the resources, say, to do all kinds of... Um, uh, 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 containment measure against uh, uh, virus spread infections, uh, you would think that in private non-religious schools, this is, uh, this is higher. And so they would be open more. This was not the case, at least not according to our data. And, and then in, uh, in January to May of 2021, you see the same differences again. Uh, the biggest difference I just want to point out is that between public schools and private schools, there's just a big gap in, in how much EIPL how much in-person learning uh, the students got, okay? Now, next, if we look at uh, the differences for the 2021 school year uh, across counties and how much in-person learning happened, you see this very stark uh, picture here, right? You see that on the coast, north, uh, northeast, and then the entire west coast, as well as um, 
and some other states here in New Mexico, Arizona, uh, you see a, a, a very low uh, in-person learning, right? Uh, under 30% on average. Uh, whereas uh, in, in Florida, uh, Texas, uh, the southern part here uh, uh, of, the, of the eastern um, part of the U.S., as well as central U.S., you see uh, essentially, uh, you know, 70 to 80 percent of in-person learning. So schools mostly open. This is common knowledge. I think it's just, again, very interesting. We can put a lot of granularity to this with our data to show that there are all these differences. OK, and just to so kind of drive this point home, you know, if you look at the top 10 and bottom 10 cities in terms of in-person learning, right, you see that top cities are uh, located in Florida and Texas. That's where you had the most in-person in learning. And on the, on the other end, in California in particular, you had very little in-person learning. And, and people who live in these places, obviously, they, they are very well aware of that. OK, OK. So second point. Now we're going into the details. We're looking at, um, at characteristics of zip codes and schools um, and how that correlates with EIPL. I should mention here, none of this is really causal. It's just correlations, but these are really interesting correlations, I would think. So first, let's look at um, local affluence as measured by mean household income in the zip code. What's really interesting here is that across the entire US, the more affluent zip code, the lower the in-person learning on average during the 2021 school year that we observe. And this is true both for private schools and public schools. And this is quite striking. You'd think that, you know, wealthier, uh, wealthier school districts, they have more uh, resources in order to uh, keep schools open. No, this is not the case. It's exactly the opposite. Same if you look at uh, the share of, uh, or at local education, sorry, uh, zip code share of adults with a college degree or higher education degree, uh, it's negatively related to uh, in-person learning, okay? And this is, uh, this is the, yeah, these are quite robust um, relationships. Okay, moving on then, at the, at the school level, there's also a negative um, relationship maybe not surprising now that you saw what's happening to income at the spending per student level of a school. Okay, so this data is only available for public schools. And you see this very strong negative relationship. Um, also interesting is that ESSER funding per student, which was um, uh, funding specifically uh, allocated by Congress to reopen schools is negatively related to uh, the, uh, the amount of in-person learning. So this is quite striking. So schools or school districts, I should say, that received more SR funding per student, they were in fact open less during the 2021 year. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to my third out of four, uh, four results that I want to show you is that um, Schools with larger share of non-white students, they also provided less in-person learning. And again, here we have data for both private and public schools, and you see this very strong negative relationship. Okay. And when we delve more into this, this is most this is in large part, and not mostly, but in large part driven by uh, the share of Hispanic students that a school has. So the larger the share of Hispanic students. In a school, the lower is the, uh, the effective in-person learning that's happening. Uh, there's also some negative relationship for the share of uh, uh, Black students. But so these are, these are the two main drivers. Okay. Now, all of this, what I showed you now, these were univariate uh, relationships, right? We are, you could argue, for instance, you know, maybe the share of non-white students uh, is a predictive um, or is negatively related to in-person learning simply because these students are in different type of schools in different types of neighborhoods. And so once we control for that, maybe this is going away. Okay. And so what we are doing in the last part of, uh, of our presentation, we're going to look at how these different correlations that I just showed you uh, are related uh, or occur, I should say, once you start controlling for other covariates, okay? And what's really interesting to note first is that 
What I showed you above, uh, affluence, education, those are highly correlated. That's maybe not uh, so surprising, but affluence and education are not that highly correlated with the amount of school spending or ESSER funds received. Also not so highly correlated uh, with the share of non-white students in, in, in schools in, in these zip codes. And so what's in, instead happening is that a lot of the, so it's not that these correlations, once you, once you throw all these variables together in a regression, they go away. In fact, they don't. What's happening instead is that these correlations that I just showed you, they're mainly accounted for by systematic regional differences, uh, in particular, Republican vote share, teacher unionization rates and cost of hiring educators, mask requirements and COVID vaccination rates. So let me finish by showing you a few results here and uh, then I'll wrap up, okay? So the brown, uh, so what are these here? These are regression coefficients, uh, meaning the average slope of the lines that I showed you before. Um, in brown, these are just the univariate uh, regression coefficients, meaning when I don't include any other variables in the regression. And you can see, right, this negative relationship for zip household income, share of college educated, school spending per student, funding, ESSER funding per student, and share of non-white students, right? And the scale here is showing you how much in-person learning changes when you move from the 25th to the 75th percentile of uh, that variable in the distribution, okay? So they're all normed or standardized. So the orange points now uh, show what happens to these regression coefficients when I throw in at the same time all the other variables Oh, meaning I, I, I put all of these five together plus some other ones that we have that I don't talk about here. And the coefficients change a bit, but not that much. Next, I'm adding these re regional characteristics such as share of Republican uh, votes uh, during the presidential election, last presidential election. And what you see is then you see large, um, large changes. So for instance, zip, uh, zip level household income is no longer any predictor at all. So meaning, it's simply that household uh, in, uh, areas that have higher income are associated with more democratic votes and um, areas that are uh, have lower household income, they have more Republican votes. And this is driving essentially all of uh, the result here that income is negatively related to, um, to in-person learning. And you see the same happening with all these other four um, uh, for uh, variables, except for the share of non-white, that still remains uh, negatively related despite all the all the controlling. And so my last graph here, well, what's happening with these regional characteristics, right? So by far, the most predictive variable in terms of R square or uh, is is um, explanatory degree is the 2020 share of Republican voters, okay? The higher that is in a particular county, the higher is in-person learning in that county during the 2021 school year. And then next, you know, the higher the teacher unionization rate, the lower is in-person learning, the higher the uh, local index of cost of hiring a, um, uh, a kindergarten to a high school educator, uh, the lower is in-person learning. The higher mask, uh, or the more there were mask requirements in public in the beginning of the pandemic, the lower is in uh, person learning in the 2021 school year. And then finally, the higher the COVID vaccination rates, the higher is in in effective in person learning. Now, we, can, we could draw potentially a lot of different conclusions from these correlations, but as I emphasized, they're not really giving you causal relationships here. This is correlations, but they are certainly intriguing, okay? So uh, finishing up, right? We combine here uh, SafeGraph data on school visits with info from different schooling mode trackers to estimate a measure of effective in-person learning. It's, we think it's a new metric that uh, is very well suited for quantitative analysis of the effects of pandemic school closures. In fact, we use it in a paper where we um, where we um, look at long potential long term impacts of earnings from uh, from school closures uh, in in a in a macro or in a in a structural model, um, the data is available publicly for anyone who wants to use it, and and we hope uh, it's useful for researchers, and um, we're also happy to hear feedback about it. And then uh, finally, yes, it just the results I showed you just raise a lot of important questions. Uh, we we think and. 
Uh, some of them have been uh, debated already uh, in different forms. So, you know, what explains the relation of in-person learning that I showed you with the different local and regional characteristics? I mean, uh, we can have different uh, opinions on this, obviously, but I think uh, digging deeper into this would certainly be interesting. And then the bigger question, I think, and that's where we see some research happening already, is that what is the impact of school closures on student achievement and well-being? And I think that's going to uh, occupy us for a bunch of years um, because a lot of these effects may only manifest themselves um, at the student level in, in, in the years to come. So thanks very much. I'm, I'm done here and I'm happy to take any questions or, or comments if there are any. Awesome. Thank you, Andre. This is fascinating. Um, I will definitely share this link out as well when I send the recording out to those who um, either attended or just registered for uh, the seminar. Also, if anyone does have questions and you're watching this as a re recording, feel free to post them uh, in the Dewey community and I'll make sure to forward it to this team so we can kind of continue the conversation there. Um, but that I think is all we have for today. So again, I really appreciate you both joining. Um, I'll be sharing the link for anyone uh, here shortly who wasn't able to make it today. But um, yeah, I think we'll close it out there. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Thank you. Yeah, have a good one. Bye.